Hi, boys and girls. Um, today I want to read you the last two special Christmas books that have special meaning to me. Um, one of them is a fun, kind of silly um, imagining of what it would be like to talk with an angel. And then the other one is a very special, um, very beautifully illustrated story of kindness and love and just gentleness overcoming sadness and hopelessness. So I hope you enjoy these and I want to wish you a Merry Merry Christmas and uh, see you hopefully in 2021. Okay, here we go. The first book is Alabaster Song, Christmas Through the Eyes of an Angel. I was six years old when I met the angel called Alabaster. That was a long time ago. I'm grown up now and have a little boy of my own, but I still remember Alabaster. Here is how I first met him. My parents always put our Christmas tree near my room. I could see it through the doorway. When everyone thought I was asleep, I would lie in bed and stare at the lights and count the shiny balls. I would watch the color glimmer on the icicles. And I know this sounds a little funny, but I would talk to the angel. High atop the tree, he sat. He had a feathery white wings and a golden halo. I knew he wasn't real. Well, at least I thought he wasn't real. But he looked so friendly with those red chubby cheeks and bright eyes. He looked young. Maybe that's why I talked to him. All my brothers and sisters were older than me. He was the only one in the house my age. So I talked to him. I named him Alabaster. I asked him questions about being an angel. Do angels have to go to bed early? Do your wings keep you warm? Do you ever get tired of sitting on the tree? He never spoke, but that didn't keep me from asking. One night when I was halfway between being asleep and awake, I asked just one more question. What was it like to see Bethlehem? That must have been the right question. Suddenly, Alabaster was standing beside my bed. It was wonderful. His face was round and his eyes were bright. His golden halo and white feathers glowed and sparkled. And when he spoke, he talked to me like we were old friends. Also, when he spoke, he sounded like he was missing his two front teeth. It was a great night. We went to the Thepperts because they were awake. They were so nice. Most of the time they thought we were stars, but that night they knew something special was in the air. He giggled with a giggle that made me giggle too. But now I was sitting on the edge of my bed. What did you do? We just sang. Want to hear it? Yeah, I said. And from that little angel came the most beautiful music. He put back his head and filled our house with a melody only heaven had heard and only heaven could make. He sang and sang like God himself was listening. I put my head on my pillow and listened until I opened my eyes and the sun was up and it was Christmas morning.
Get up. It was my dad shaking me. Come see your presents. I jumped out of bed and ran to the tree. There was everything I had asked for. Skates, a baseball glove, and a train. I was so excited, I forgot all about alabaster. Soon all the presents were open and we all sat around talking and laughing and looking at the new stuff. That's when I heard the song again. Alabaster song. The room was full of it. I looked up. Little Alabaster was on the tree with his head back and his mouth open. He was singing, just like the night before. I looked around at my family. No one else was looking at the angel. They were all talking like nothing was happening. Do you hear the singing? I asked my dad. No. Do you, Ma? No, she answered. No one else heard him, but I heard him as clear as if I were on the tree next to him. His head was turned toward the window and he was singing to Jesus, just like he had done that first night in Bethlehem. The next Christmas, when I was seven, I heard him again, and the next, he would stop at my bed on Christmas Eve and sing, and from the top of the tree on Christmas morning, he would sing to Jesus. Every year I saw him. Every year I heard him. Then I got older. I forgot to look for him. I forgot to listen for him. After a few Christmases, I didn't hear him anymore. I forgot about his song till today. Today is Christmas, and this morning as we opened presents, I noticed my little boy looking at the angel on the tree. After a moment, he turned to me and said, Do you hear the song, Daddy? Fun imagination on that song, huh? I mean, on that uh, book. Okay, this one is called, I'm going to turn this because I need to show you the pages better. The Christmas Miracle of Jonathan Toomey. And the art, the illustrator in this one is uh, P.J. Lynch. And the pictures are just so good. The village children called him Mr. Gloomy. But in fact, his name was Toomey. Mr. Jonathan to me. And though it's not kind to call people names, this one fit quite well. For Jonathan to me seldom smiled and never laughed. He went about mumbling and grumbling. He muttered and sputtered, grumped and griped. He complained that the church bells rang too shrilly that the birds sang too loudly, that the children played way too loudly. Mr. Toomey was a woodcarver. Some said he was the best woodcarver in the whole valley. He spent his days sitting at a workbench carving beautiful shapes from blocks of pine and hickory and chestnut wood. After supper, he sat in a straight-backed chair near the fireplace, smoking his pipe and staring into the flames. Jonathan Toomey wasn't an old man, but if you saw him, you might think he was, the way he walked bent forward with his head down. You wouldn't notice his eyes, the clear blue of an August sky, and you wouldn't see the dimple on his chin because his face was mostly covered with a shaggy, untrimmed beard speckled with sawdust and wood shavings, and depending what he ate that day, crumbs of bread 
or a bit of potato or dried gravy. The village people didn't know it, but there was a reason for his gloom, a reason for his grumbling, a reason why he walked hunched over as if carrying a weight on his shoulders, a great weight. Some years earlier, when Jonathan Toomey was young and full of life and full of love, his wife and baby had become very sick. And because those were the days before hospitals and medicines and skilled doctors, his wife and baby died three days apart from each other. So Jonathan Toomey had packed his belongings into a wagon and traveled till his tears stopped. He settled into a tiny house at the edge of a village to do his wood carving. One day in early December, there was a knock at Jonathan's door. Mumbling and grumbling, he went to answer it. There stood a woman and a young boy. I'm the widow McDowell. I'm new in your village. This is my son, Thomas, the woman said. I'm seven and I know how to whistle, said Thomas. Whistling is pish posh, said the woodcarver gruffly. I need something carved, said the woman, and she told Jonathan about a very special set of Christmas figures her grandfather had carved for her when she was a girl. After I moved here, I discovered that they were lost, she explained. I had hoped that by some miracle I would find them again, but it hasn't happened. There are no such thing as miracles, the woodcarver told her. Now could you describe the figures for me? There were sheep, she told him. Two of them with curly wool, added Thomas. Yes, two, said the widow. And a cow and an angel, Mary, Joseph, the baby Jesus, and the wise men. Three of them, added Thomas. Will you take the job? asked the widow McDowell. I will. I'm grateful. How soon can you have them ready? They will be ready when they are ready, he said. But I must have them at Christmas. They mean very much to me. I can't remember a Christmas without them. Christmas is pish posh, said Jonathan gruffly, and he shut the door. The following week, there was a knock at the woodcarver's door. Muttering and sputtering, he went to answer it. There stood the widow McDowell and Thomas. Excuse me, said the widow, but Thomas has been begging to come and watch you work. He says he wants to be a woodcarver when he grows up and would like to watch you since you are the best in the valley. I'll be quiet. You won't even know I'm here. I promise. Please, please piped in Thomas. With a grumble, the woodcarver steps aside to let them in. He pointed to a stool near his workbench. No talking, no jiggling, no noise, he ordered Thomas. The widow McDowell handed Mr. Toomey a warm loaf of cornbread as a token of thanks. Then she took out her knitting and sat down in a rocking chair in the far corner of the cottage. Not there, bellowed the woodcarver. No one sits in that chair. So she moved to the straight back chair by the fire. Thomas sat very still. Once, when he needed to sneeze, he pressed his finger under his nose to hold it back. Once, when he wanted desperately to scratch his leg, he counted to 20 to keep his mind off the itch. After a very long time, Thomas cleared his throat and whispered, Mr. Toomey, may I ask a question? The woodcarver glared at Thomas, then shrugged his shoulders and grunted. Thomas decided that meant yes, so he went on. Is that my sheep you're carving? The woodcarver nodded and grunted again. After another very long time, Thomas whispered, Mr. Toomey, 
Excuse me, but you're carving my sheep wrong. The widow McDowell's knitting needle stopped clicking. Jonathan Toomey's knife stopped carving. Thomas went on. It's a beautiful sheep, nice and curly, but my sheep looked happy. That's pish posh, said Mr. Toomey. Sheep are sheep, they cannot look happy. Mine did, answered Thomas. They knew they were with the baby Jesus, so they were happy. After that, Thomas was quiet for the rest of the afternoon. When the church bells chimed six o'clock, Mr. Toomey grumbled under his breath about the awful noise. The widow McDowell said it was time to leave. Thomas sneezed three times, then thanked the woodcarver for allowing him to watch. That evening, after a supper of cornbread and boiled potatoes, the woodcarver sat down at his bench and picked up his knife. He picked up the sheep and worked until his eyelids drooped shut. Do you look curly? A few days later, there was a knock at the woodcarver's door again. Griping and grumbling, he went to the door to answer it. There stood the widow and her son. Now watch again. I will be quiet, said Thomas. He settled himself on the stool very quietly while his mother laid a basket of sweet-smelling raisin buns on the table. The teapot is warm, Mr. Toomey said gruffly, his head bent over his work. While Mr. Toomey carved, the widow McDowell poured tea. She touched the woodcarver gently on the shoulder and placed a cup of tea beside him and a warm bun. He pretended not to notice, but soon both the plate and the cup were empty. Thomas tried to eat his bun that his mother had given him as quietly as he could, but it is almost impossible to eat a warm, sticky raisin bun without making various smacking licking satisfied noises. When Thomas had finished, he tried to sit quietly. Once he almost hiccuped, but he took a deep breath and held it till his face turned red. And once without thinking, he began to swing his legs, but a glare from the woodcarver stopped him and he kept them so still they fell asleep. After a very long time, Thomas whispered, Mr. Toomey, excuse me, May I ask a question? Grunt. Is that my cow you're carving? A nod and grunt. Another very long time went by. Then Thomas cleared his throat and said, Mr. Toomey, excuse me, but I must tell you something. That is a beautiful cow. The most beautiful cow I have ever seen. But it's not right. My cow looked proud. That's pish posh, growled the woodcarver. Cows are cows. They cannot look proud. My cow did because it knew that Jesus chose to be born in its barn. So it was proud. Thomas was quiet for the rest of the afternoon. The only sounds that could be heard were the scraping of the carving knife, the humming of the widow McDowell, and the click click of her knitting needles. When the church bells chimed six o'clock, Mr. Toomey muttered under his breath about the noise. The widow said it was time to leave, and Thomas shook first one leg, then the other. He thanked the woodcarver for allowing him to watch. That evening, after a supper of boiled potatoes and sticky raisin buns, the woodcarver sat down to carve the, pat the cow. He picked up his carving knife, picked up the cow, and worked until his eyelids drooped shut. A few days later, there was a knock at the woodcarver's door. He smoothed down his hair as he went to answer it. At the door were the widow and her son. May I watch again? asked Thomas. As Mrs. McDowell warmed the tea and put a plate of fresh molasses cookies on the workbench, Thomas watched the woodcarver work on the figure of an angel. After a very long time, Thomas spoke. Mr. Toomey, excuse me, is that my angel you're carving? Yes, and would you do me the favor of telling me exactly what I'm doing wrong? Well, my 
angel look like one of God's most important angels because it was sent to baby Jesus. And just how does one make an angel look important, asked the woodcarver. You'll be able to do it, said Thomas. You are the best woodcarver in the valley. After another very long time, Thomas spoke. Mr. Toomey, excuse me, may I ask a question? Do you ever stop talking? asked the woodcarver. My mother says I don't. She says I could learn about the virtue of silence from you. Under his beard, the woodcarver's cheeks turned pink. The widow McDowell's face turned as red as the scarf she was knitting. Well, speak up. What is your question? Will you please teach me to carve? I am a very busy man, grumbled the woodcarver. But he put down the important angel. You will carve a bird. A robin, I hope, said Thomas. I like robins. With a piece of charcoal, the woodcarver sketched a robin on a piece of brown paper. Then he handed Thomas a small block of pine wood and a knife. He showed him how to lock the corners from the block and slowly smooth the edges of the wood. Thomas copied the woodcarver's strokes, head bent, tongue working from side to side of his lower lip as he concentrated. When the church bells rang at six o'clock, Jonathan Toomey was holding Thomas's hand in his, guiding the knife along the edge of a wing. He didn't hear them ringing. The widow McDowell said it was time to leave. Thomas brushed wood shavings from his shirt and reached out and brushed two especially large pieces of wood shavings from the woodcarver's beard. He thanked Thomas for he thanked Jonathan for teaching him how to carve. Later, after a supper of molasses cookies and boiled potatoes, Jonathan Toomey went to work on the angel. He sketched drawing after drawing. Finally, he picked up his carving knife, picked up the angel, and carved until his eyelids drooped shut. A few days, a few days later, there was a knock on the woodcarver's door, and Mr. Toomey jumped up to answer it. There stood the widow McDowell with a bouquet of pine boughs and holly sprigs dotted with berries, and there stood Thomas clutching his partly carved robin. While Thomas and Mr. Toomey carved, Mrs. McDowell put the bouquet in a jar of water. She scrubbed Mr. Toomey's kitchen table and set the jar in the center on a pretty cloth embroidered with lilies of the valley and daisies, which she had found in a drawer below the cupboard. Next, I will carve the wise men and Joseph, the woodcarver said to Thomas. Perhaps before I begin, you will tell me about all the mistakes I'm going to make. Well, said Thomas. My wise men were wearing their most wonderful robes because they were going to visit Jesus. And my Joseph, he was leaning over baby Jesus like he was protecting him. He looked very serious. It wasn't until the church bells had chimed and the widow and her son were preparing to go that Mr. Toomey saw the jar of pine boughs um, and the scrub table and the cloth lying on the table. I found the cloth in a drawer. I thought it would look pretty on the table, the widow McDowell said, smiling. Never open that drawer, the woodcarver said harshly. When the two had left, Jonathan put the cloth away. That evening, after a supper of boiled potatoes, the woodcarver worked on Joseph and the wise men until his eyelids drooped shut. Now, the only thing I do not like about this book is they don't talk about the shepherds, which I thought was very odd because the wise men actually came to visit Jesus when Jesus was a toddler, when he was at a house. If you look in your Bibles, and you can check that out and check me out. And they don't have the shepherds in this book, so I was rather surprised about that. A few days later, there was a knock on the woodcarver's door. He dusted the crumbs from his beard and brushed the sawdust from his shirt. At the door were the widow McDowell and Thomas. 
All afternoon, Thomas watched the woodcarver work. When it was time to leave, Jonathan said to Thomas, I am about to begin the last two figures, Mary and the baby. Can you tell me how your figures looked? They were the most special of all, said Thomas. Jesus was smiling and reaching up to his mother, and Mary looked like she loved him very much. Thank you, Thomas, said the woodcarver. Tomorrow is Christmas. Is there any chance the figures will be ready? The widow McDowell asked. They will be ready when they are ready. I understand, said the widow, and she handed Jonathan two packages. Merry Christmas, she said. Jonathan folded his arms across his chest. I want no presents, he said harshly. That is exactly why we are giving them, answered the widow. She put them down on the table and left. Jonathan sat down at the table. Slowly he opened the first package. Inside was a red scarf, hand-knit, warm and bright. He tied the scarf around his neck. The other package held a robin, crudely carved of pine. A smile twitched at the corners of Jonathan Toomey's mouth as he ran his fingers over the lopsided wings. He dusted the mantelpiece and placed the robin on it so he could look at it from his chair. Whoops, sorry, there it is. The woodcarver did not eat supper that day. Instead, he began to sketch the final figures, Mary and Jesus. He drew Mary, then wadded the sketch into a ball and tossed it on the floor. He drew the baby, wadded the sketch into a ball, and tossed it with the first. He sketched again. Once more, he crumpled the paper. Soon there was a small mountain of crumpled papers at his feet. He picked up a block of wood and tried to carve, but his knife would not do what he wanted it to do. He hurled the chunk of wood into the fireplace and sat staring into the flames. When he heard the church bells announcing the midnight Christmas service, Jonathan Toomey got up. Slowly, he opened the drawer beneath the cupboard that the widow had been told never to open. From it, he took the cloth embroidered with lilies of the valley, a rough woolen shawl, and a lace handkerchief. He took out a tiny white baby blanket and a little pair of blue socks. He placed each piece gently on the floor. From the bottom of the drawer, he lifted out a picture frame, beautifully carved of deep brown chestnut wood. In the frame was a charcoal sketch of a woman sitting in a rocking chair holding a baby. The baby's arms were reaching up and touching the woman's face. The woman was looking down at the baby, smiling. Jonathan sat down in his rocking chair and held the picture against his chest. He slowly closed his eyes. He rocked slowly. Two tears trailed down his beard. When he finally took the picture to his workbench and began to carve, his fingers worked quickly and surely. He carved all through the night. The next day, there was a knock at the widow McDowell's door. When she opened it, there stood the woodcarver his neck wrapped in a red shawl, holding a wooden box stuffed with straw. Mr. Toomey, said the widow, what a surprise. Merry Christmas. The figures are ready, he said as he stepped inside. And from the box, Jonathan unpacked two curly sheep, happy sheep, because they were with Jesus. He unpacked a proud cow an angel, a very important angel with mighty wings stretching from its shoulders right down to the hem of its gown. He unpacked three wise men wearing their most wonderful robes edged with fur and falling in rich folds. He unpacked a serious and caring Joseph, Mary wearing a rough woolen shawl, looking down, loving her precious baby son. Jesus was smiling and reaching up to touch his mother's face. And that day, 
Jonathan went to Christmas service with the widow McDowell and Thomas. And that day in the churchyard, the village children saw Jonathan throw back his head, showing his eyes as clear blue as an August sky, and laugh. No one ever called him Mr. Gloomy again.